Our text this week out of the book of Zechariah, chapter 5, judgments on wickedness or wicked condemned, right? The wickedness condemned. And so we'll look at some verses here. Two little prophecies in this chapter. Starting verse 1, I turned and I raised my eyes and I saw there a flying scroll. And he said, what do you see? And so I answered, I see a flying scroll. And its length is 20 cubits and it's width 10 cubits. Now that's a pretty big scroll. That's a very big scroll. That's like 30 feet by 15 feet. You got this huge, like a billboard, flying across the earth with uh, this, this, this scroll form. Um, it's like a Torah scroll held up, but just flying across the earth. So God's message, kind of like written on the scroll for all to see, flying in the air, visible to all, written in the sky. And he said, this is the curse that goes out over the face of the whole earth. Every thief shall be expelled according to this side of the scroll, and every perjurer shall be expelled according to that side of it. And I will send out the curse, says the Lord of hosts, and it shall enter the house of the thief and the house of the one who swears falsely by my name. It shall remain in the midst of his house and consume it with its timbers and stones. So this scroll with this message on it is two-sided. So it's got a message on one side, not like our typical highway billboard, just one-sided. It's positioned in such a way as it's floating through the earth, flying through the earth. Whichever side you're able to see, you've got a message there for you. So a dual message, double message from this scroll flying over to the whole entire earth, the whole earth. So it's not just a message just for Israel, not just local, but to go and it goes forth across the earth and it's flying there. So again, visible and moving. And it says, every thief shall be expelled. So God's going to deal with the thieves. They're going to be kicked out. They're going to be expelled out of the land. They're going to be expelled out of the earth. They're going to be dealt with once and for all. And that's a good promise. That's good hope for us. So if you've ever been ripped off, if you've ever been robbed, if you've ever had something taken from you, God will deal with it. He will expel the thieves. And then the other side, the perjurer shall also be expelled. And so if someone has uh, promised something to you and didn't come forward, didn't come through with it, they've presented something falsely, they've misled, they've coerced, they've manipulated to make a sale or to uh, get you to do something or not do something, they've, they will be dealt with as well. The perjurers will be purged from the earth. God will deal with them. They will be expelled. And I'll send out a curse. And so God deals with these thieves and these liars by sending a curse upon them, and it enters into their house. And it remains in the midst of their house. And so to every perjurer, every thief, God sends his conviction. God sends his disapproving frown upon them and brings guilt into their minds and hearts. And that's why most crimes, most thefts take place in the dark, in dark alleys and at night. And robbers come at night and break into the home. They don't usually come in the middle of the day. They don't want to be seen. Why don't they want to be seen? Well, they don't want to be caught, but they also know they're doing wrong. And they're ashamed of it. And lies also. We cover up lies with more lies because we're ashamed of it. God has given, he's spent, sent forth from, the, from heaven to this earth the spirit of guilt, to lay guilt upon us, this curse upon us. And we realize that it is wrong to do. And it nags at them, it nags at them, it nags at them. And it stays within the house. It stays within their heart. It stays within their mind. Never to be forgotten. God always bringing it back up and bringing conviction over and over again. And why does he do that? Because he loves them. He sends forth a banner flying through the earth with a warning 
to the thieves, to the liars, out of love. He can just go and condemn them. He can just go and strike them down. He can just go and get rid of them, but he doesn't want to do that. He wants to bring them to repentance. He wants to draw them with his love. He wants to bring about a change in their lives. And so he sends forth this huge banner, this huge billboard flying through the earth to send a message to them, to warn them. And then he sends his Holy Spirit into their hearts and in their minds to stir up this feeling of wrong, to bring about repentance, to give them the gift of repentance, a desire to turn from that lifestyle, to turn from their thievery, to turn from their lying. And it gnaws at them and sits in their house. And if it remains, if it's not confessed, if it's not turned over, God has provided a way of escape. He's provided the Messiah. And we can turn over those problems, those sins, confess them, receive forgiveness, have them removed from our house, have them removed from our life, have them placed upon the Messiah, have them forgiven, have them cleansed, have them killed, have them crucified, and receive new hearts and new lives and new minds, new desires, new attitudes, new words, new actions. But if we refuse and we hold on to them, it will consume the house with its timbers and its stones. Even the stones are going to burn up. Even the stones are going to melt away with God's final judgment. God will deal with them once and for all. We might sometimes see why. Question why. Why are they allowing to prosper? Why does it seem like these thieves are prospering? They're, 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 they're misusing their employees, working them harder, not paying them enough, not giving them right proper benefits. Nowhere in comparison to what the CEOs or the owners or the, the board is making. They're making so much more, there's not enough hours in a day or a week or a year to earn that much. And they're making this exorbitant amount and the workers are just making enough to get by. Extortion and stealing and selling products that are made to break down as soon as the warranty is over disposable society we live in. It just throw away everything. But why do they, but God will, and someone's asking a question, why are they prospering? Why are they getting away with it? Why does it seem like the thieves aren't caught? Why does it seem like the liars aren't exposed and dealt with? Why are they able to lie and, and, and even when they're exposed, they just continue on it. They don't get fired. They don't get outvoted. They stay in their positions for decades and decades and decades. How come it continues on and continues on? How come some get away with it? Well, they don't get away with it forever. As we read in the last two chapters in both of them, it mentioned God has seven eyes. And his eyes go throughout the earth. He sees it. He knows. He knows what's going on. He, He's not fooled. He will not be mocked. He will have his judgment day. But right now he's sending forth his banner. Right now he's sending forth his spirit. Right now he's sending forth the curse upon them and drawing them. But if they refuse, there will be the eternal judgment. The house will be consumed, both the timbers and the stones, everything burned up. The elements will melt with fervent heat and the earth therein will be burned up, and the heavens and the earth will be burned up. There will be nothing remaining. He will destroy it all, root and branch. The soul that sinneth, he will be destroyed. He shall die. That will burn it all up. Fear not him who can destroy the body, but rather fear him, the Lord God, who will destroy both soul and body in hell. He will destroy it, he will consume it, timber and stone, Completely, he will deal with the wicked. Now we may say, well, I'm so thankful I'm not like them. I'm so thankful I'm not on that path. I'm so thankful I'm not a thief. I'm so thankful I don't wear masks and go into stores. Well, maybe you do, but I don't go into a mask in a store with a, a, a loaded gun pointed at, a, at, a, uh, at someone to steal from them. I'm so thankful I haven't uh, gone and, and done something as brazen as that, 
I'm not an open thief. But maybe that doesn't mean we don't steal. That doesn't mean we're not thieves. Because both of these attributes, interesting, these are the two things that God chose to put on this scroll to send throughout the whole earth. He could have named a lot of things. He could have named pride. He could have named selfishness. He could have named greed. He could have named a lot of sins to put on there. Could have put adultery on there. Lots of things on there. But these are the two that he has chosen to put on there. And they are, in a lot of ways, all-encompassing. One of the first sins was Adam, Eve taking from a tree that was forbidden to her. She was stealing. She was taking something that was not hers. God created it. God put it in her reach. But he said, that's not yours. All these other trees I've created for you, no doubt hundreds, if not thousands, if not billions of trees you can eat from. But this one tree, stay away from. This one is mine. This one is the test of whether you obey. This is the test of whether you really love me. This is the test of whether you believe me. This is the test of whether you trust me. Just stay away from this tree. And she didn't. She went and she stole from it. And then in addition to that, she began to lie. The serpent lied to her and she misled Adam and then they both lied to God. Well, it's not my fault. It was his fault. It was her fault. It was your fault. Lying and stealing goes back to the very beginning of our nature. And it's there in each one of us. We steal, we steal the attention. We steal little things here and there. We steal people's time. At work, employers, one of the greatest loss, if not the greatest loss of financial finances for any company is employee theft that takes place. Whether it's paying for the person to work hours and they're on their Facebook, they're on their computer, they're on doing personal email time on company time, talking on the phone on company time, talking to another fellow worker about non-work related stuff on company time, stealing time away from the company, lying about when they came in or when they left or how many hours they worked, or all the stuff that walks out the door with the employee not paid for. Oh, they got so much of this stuff and then they go home and brag to their family, look at what I got at work today. Look at what they got in. They got a shipment of this. They're never gonna get rid of it. They're never gonna use up all this stuff. They have no need of all this. Small as paper clips or as big as refrigerators, hauled out the back door. I was working in a produce department. Um, I was a young teenager, and I saw this guy out that we were unloading, and, and uh, I saw this guy, and he had this parka on, and it wasn't the middle of winter, but he had this parka on, and it had this hood, uh, the kind of hoods they had back then, it had this fur thing around the hood, and he had it drawn tight. You couldn't really even see his face at all. And he seemed like a homeless person, and I called him over, and I gave him a bunch of bananas. That's what we were unloading. That's what we had, so I just gave him a bunch of bananas. And he thanked me and he walked away. And I thought, oh, how generous I was. How good I was. How nice I was. Helping out this poor, needy person. And my boss saw me and he said to me, a little later, he said, I saw what you did and it was very nice, but it was wrong. They weren't my bananas. <laughs> They were public bananas. It wasn't public then. It was uh, Windex. Not, uh, um, I forget. Wall bombs. Wall bombs in New York. It was their bananas. It wasn't my bananas to give away. You can't be generous with someone else's stuff. We take and we, like Robin Hood, right? Robin Hood was a thief. If he, he wasn't a real person, but whatever the case. We take, we steal, we... We think we're doing good or we're helping ourselves, helping our family with stuff that's not ours. Wasn't given to us. Wasn't approved. Wasn't put in our hands. And we'll do that. And we'll lie. We, have our, we lie to ourselves. We lie to our family. We lie to others. We lie about our walk with God. We lie about 
our actions and our desires. We fool ourselves. When we profess to be believers and we're not living as believers, we're not living victoriously, we're not really believing, are we? We say we're followers of Messiah, but we're not doing anything like he does. Or maybe some things, but not all things. As Yeshua said to the one young man, one thing thou lackest. Until we've surrendered all, we're really not walking in his footsteps. In his likeness. And there's another area where we steal that the Bible brings out, even as believers. In Malachi chapter 3, verse 8, will a man rob God? How audacious to rob from God. Yet you have robbed me. But you say, when have we robbed you? In tithe and in offerings. Oh, now people might not reach into the tzedakah box and take out other people's tithes and offerings. But when we don't return what God has blessed us with, we're doing really the same thing that Eve did. God places all these things in our reach. He placed all the trees in her reach. He placed the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in her reach. And God places in our reach, he places into our hands all the finances that he makes available to us. But they all still come from God. God's given us the ability to get a job. God's given us the ability to gain wealth. He's given us brains. He's given us hands. He's given us talents. He's given us feet. He's given us mouths. He's given us eyes. He's given us the ability to earn wealth. But it all comes from God. God gave us those abilities. God opened those doors. God got us that education. God gave us that talent. God gave us the ability to get wealth. And so all of it is his, really. Even if you find a dollar on the road, right? He gave us the ability to get that. He puts it within our reach, but he says, oh, there's this one little portion even though I gave you the ability to get that 100%, I'm going to let you keep 90% of it. That's a pretty good deal. Right? How would you like that? If you worked for some company and they, they lined up all the sales, they lined up all the contracts, they let you use all their equipment, they paid for all the equipment, they paid for the insurance on the equipment, they paid for the repairs and the upkeep of all the equipment, they trained you, they sent you to school, they did everything possible. And then you go and you sell the product and they let you keep 90% of it. That'd be pretty good. There's not a company in the world that does that. But that's what God does. He provides everything for us, provides all the means for us. And then he says, you can keep 90%, but there's 10%. That's my tree. That's mine. This is my test of your love. This is my test of your loyalty. This is my test of your faith. This is my test of your obedience. This is my test of your trust. And then if you want to give offerings on top of that, out of the 90% I let you keep, that's up to you. But we rob from him when we don't return the 10% and we don't give offerings on top of that back to God. We're robbing from him, from what is his, rightfully his, and we rob from him. I believe that if every professed believer, and this is an area where we lie, we say we're, we're believers and, and we're not following some very simple commands, not simple to the nature, carnal nature, because our thieving, selfish, lying hearts make up excuses and reasons why and doesn't apply to me. And, and so we lie to ourselves, we lie to God, we lie to others. But to a tra truly transformed heart, one that has confessed the sin, has surrendered it to the Lord, has received of his Holy Spirit to give them victory over sin, and partakes of the divine nature, we become givers just like God is a giver. For God so loved, he gave his only begotten son. God gave to Adam and Eve. God has given to us all things pertaining to godliness and righteousness, that we may be partakers of the divine nature. God is a constant giver. And when we are taking of that nature, we give also. It becomes natural, it becomes part of our nature to be generous and faithful in returning and trusting. And so if every professed believer gave a faithful tithe and offering, I believe this gospel would have gone to the world long before now. Three times over, and we'd be in heaven already. 
But because we lie about who we are and we lie about our faith and we lie about believing in God and we steal from God, we're still here as a result. And God's curse remains in the household and will eventually burn both timber and stone. That is the first little prophecy in this chapter. And then the second one, the angel who talked with me came out and said, lift up your eyes now and see what is this that goes forth. And I asked, what is it? And in verse 6, he said, this is the resemblance throughout the earth. Not just Israel, but throughout the earth. Here is a lead disc lifted up. And this is a woman sitting inside the basket. This is wickedness. And he thrust her down into the basket and threw the lead cover over its mouth. Wow, very interesting imagery here. Very interesting what well, God is showing Zechariah. This basket with this woman, she's sitting in it, probably she's sitting in such a way, or maybe her head, part of her body sticking out, she's sitting there, and she has to get pushed down, she has to get thrust down. She is wickedness, and she's pressed down and thrust down, and then a lead weight, a lead cap has to be put over the basket. And she's radioactive. Right? So there's a lead cap to put over it to keep the wickedness from per uh, getting out, seeping out. Interesting imagery here. And I raised my eyes and I looked, and there were two women coming with the wind in their wings, for they had wings like the wings of a stork. And they lifted up the basket between earth and heaven. That's interesting imagery too, right? I'll tell you, you don't need to do LSD. You know, I mean, just read the Bible. I mean, there's some amazing, uh, you know, word pictures in the Bible that that, uh, that God showed to these prophets to get his illustration across. This basket with this woman in it, pressed down, lead cover on it, and these two other women with large wings, like wings like a stork. And I don't know, maybe that's where they get the baby, bring, the, the, the storks bringing babies. I don't know, maybe, maybe it was from this Bible passage, I don't know. But these two women with these large wings, like storks, and they come together and they grab a hold of that basket, and they fly the basket away. Interesting. Lift up this basket. Take this wickedness away. And so I asked the angel who talked with me, where are they carrying the basket? And he said, to build a house for it in the land of Shinar. And when it is ready, the basket will be set there on its base. So these two women with wings like a stork, they take up this Basket with this woman in it, wickedness. And they bring her to Babylon, Shinar, referring to Babylon. Now, at this time when this prophecy is taking place, God has called his people out of Babylon, which is now Medo-Persia, become Medo-Persia, called us out of there and to come back to the land, to come back to Israel, to build up Jerusalem, to build up the temple, to build up the nation again. And there was lots of opposition, there were lots of trials and difficulties, but God had raised up faithful people, such as in the last two chapters, Yeshua ben Yehosadak, the Kohen Gadol, and a governor, Zerubbabel, faithful man, but also was needed, and wonderful promises to them, Wonderful promises of the restoration. Wonderful promises of the building. You will set the, the foundation and you will complete it. Wonderful promises. But in God working a revival, wickedness still has to leave. Wickedness still has to go. Wickedness still has to be pointed out. Wickedness has to be, sins have to be shown and demonstrated, put on scrolls, put on banners, and flown through the earth and exposed and revealed and condemned, called out, and then shoved into a basket, covered up and taken away and sent back to Babylon, back to the land of confusion, 
And in these last days, God is calling us to come out of Babylon. Come out of Babylon. Babylon has fallen. It's fallen, my people. Come out of Babylon. God's called us out. And even though it was only a faithful remnant that came out, it took faith to come out and to go to a land that's broken down, to cities broken down, to farmlands that's laid waste for 70 years. That took faith and courage and then the give of their resources to build up the temple. It took faithful people. But obviously some of the people who came out of Babylon took Babylon with them. And it's being condemned here and it's being said, no, send it back to Babylon. Send the lying and the stealing back to Babylon where it belongs. No room in God's house for it. When we came out of Egypt, a mixed multitude came with us. And the Bible tells us they were some of the first ones to cry out, let's go back to Egypt. We miss the leeks. We miss the onions. We want to go back to Egypt and cause trouble in the camp. Today, God has called us out of Babylon. The early believers came out of, as Paul says, some of you were, he lists a whole bunch of different sinful tendencies, so, which some of you were in the past, but now you have become the children of God. You have become part of the commonwealth of Israel, adopted in. And then, yet, a few years after Paul's writings, 100 AD or so, the leaders decided we need to reach more. We need to reach the community around us. We need to adopt some of their ways so that they'll feel more comfortable. And so we'll take some of their statues and we'll bring their statues into our houses of worship and we'll let them continue to pray to their statues, but we'll just rename the statues. We'll make them biblical. We'll baptize the statues. We'll take their holidays and we'll just rework their holidays and rename their holidays or keep the same name but give it different meaning and apply it to some biblical time and taking in Babylon with us, taking in the world with us, taking in confusion with us. It wasn't a winning strategy. It caused us to go into the dark ages. It caused the Bible to be compromised and Bible truth to be compromised. And today we're no better. Babylon has creeped in among Bible believers, professed Bible believers, and we're just like the world in many ways not standing for anything. Just this week, on a very prominent so-called news channel, been around for quite some time, and one of its main spokespersons, so-called reporter, is at a prime time spot, was talking with, interviewing with, another one of its name spokespersons. And he said, in his talk together, he said, Jesus Christ, when he was walking on this earth, wasn't perfect. He was trying to make his argument that people aren't perfect, and even he wasn't perfect. And the guy he was speaking with didn't question him, didn't refute him. Where's the uproar among Christians? A few years back, the Beatles, I think it was John Lennon who made a statement, we're bigger than Jesus Christ. Now he wasn't saying he was greater or smarter, but that we're becoming more popular, which was a stupid statement anyway, because, I mean, he wasn't counting all the, all the believers all around the world, but nonetheless, he made the statement. Well, immediately there was a backlash. People took their records off their shelves, went out into the street, threw them on the ground, broke their records, burned them. Today? Not a word, nothing, no protest, no demanding an apology, no demanding him to, take, to lose his job, no demanding he get educated in what people believe. 
No, he can believe what he wants. He can think what he wants to go but make a statement like that, like some authority. There's no protest. There's nothing. Yet we think if we just go and we, we'd be nice, if we'd be nice, then they'll think we're nice, and then somehow they'll think they'll want to believe like we believe. Why would they want to believe like we believe when we're following them? It's supposed to be peculiar people. Give me an example of the Bible where that has been done and worked. Moses didn't go up to Pharaoh and say, oh, hey, Pharaoh, you know, we're good people, we're nice people, we're chums, we're buds. Right? Did he go and try and be friendly with Pharaoh? Or did he go and said, God said, let my people go. He spoke truth to power, the most powerful in the world at that time. Johann the Immerser, he said to the leader of the land, that's adultery you're committing. You took your brother's wife. He got beheaded for it. But he still spoke it. He wasn't afraid. He wasn't ashamed. We're afraid. Oh, they may come burn down our building. Oh, they may graffiti our building. Oh, they may get me fired. They might condemn me. They might behead me. They might kill me. You should have called them vipers. You can't get much worse than that. Whitewashed sepulchers. Oh, I can't take his tweets. Oh, those tweets. Oh, I don't know why. Somebody, John, Peter, why don't you talk to him? Don't tell him to talk like that. Don't upset everybody. He's talking too, too plainly. He's talking too harshly. Why is he talking like that? Can't you talk to him? Why don't you monitor what he's saying? He spoke the truth in love to draw them to repentance, to correct them, to expose their hypocrisy to expose their lies, not to shame them, but to send the curse into the home so that they would repent of their sins. To lift up the banner high, there is no room for sin in God's camp. There is no room for wickedness in God's house. There is no room for wickedness in the temple of the Lord in each of us individually and corporately as a temple of God. We entered into the land of Canaan. The walls of Jericho come down. Achan, one of the soldiers, he says, oh, there's a little bit of stuff. We don't, oh, God doesn't need all this. There's some little clothes here. I can use this. Here's some little silver, some gold. God has enough already. And he takes some and he buries it under his tent. And God said, there's no room for wickedness in my camp. And God sought him out till he was found, and he and his whole household were cast out. There's no room in God's house. He kicked out Lucifer, one of his covering cherubs, and one-third of his angels. He'd say, boy, we can't lose all them. Oh, boy, if I speak the truth, one-third of the congregation will leave. Oh, no, I better not speak that. I'll just speak love and kindness and prosperity and everything's going to go well, everything's going to go good, you're good, you're go I'm good, we're all good, everything's good, right? Kumbaya, pat each other on the back. No. God said, I'm sorry, that can't dwell here, that can't be here, and he lost one third. Could you imagine one third? That'd be devastating to any congregation. That'd be devastating to any company to have one third of its employees walk out one day. To fire one-third of the employees in one day. How are you going to continue to operate? God said, I'm sorry, there's no room for wickedness here. Adam and Eve, he kicked out 100% of his children. Two out of two, get out. There's no room in the Garden of Eden for wickedness. There's no room for thievery. There's no room for lying. There's no room for perjury. There's no room for wickedness here. And there should be no room in our hearts, no room in our lives. Allow the Holy Spirit to search us and try us. Start with ourselves. No room for a speck in our eye. Allow God to go deep. Allow God to show us. Allow God to bring us the gift of repentance and turn from our wickedness and turn from our sins. First and foremost with ourselves. 
then within our families, and then within our congregation, and into the world. And see what God will do. That's what's needed before revival, before the promises of rebuilding the temple, before the promises of rebuilding the city, before the promises of rebuilding the nation, and before the promise of, of entering into heaven. Before the promise of the gospel going to the world, that's what has to start. Judgment has to start in the household of God. We have to start with ourselves and be real with ourselves. Before Yeshua sent the disciples out after his death and burial and resurrection, he said, stay in Jerusalem for 40 days, and in 10 days they were in the upper room. And I don't think they were partying, I think they were repenting. I think they were confessing to one another. Sorry, I wanted to be the boss. I'm sorry, Peter, I hated your guts. I'm sorry, John, you're, I thought you were ugly. Whatever, they, they, they turned over their competition against one another and became united together. And look at what God did to 11 people. He took the gospel to the then known world. Through those 11, others came. Stephen came. Through Stephen, Paul came. Through Paul, the gospel went forward even to Rome, even to Caesar's household. God can use 11 God can use even less. If sin is cleansed out of the house, nothing is impossible for the Lord. We need to call sin by its right name. In our own lives, and let God do his work. And send it back to Babylon. Stop bringing the world in with us. If you come out of the world, then come out of the world and come into God's truth and stand as God's peculiar people, shining as bright lights, shining as contrast to the world. But right now, as a whole, professed believers are not standing as contrast to the world. We're standing stock, stock and shoulder with them. Whenever they say something is wrong, that's what the bag wagon we jump on. We do like they do. We listen like they listen. We watch what they watch. We buy what they buy. And we follow along. It's obedient little lemmings doing whatever they say, even when it contradicts the Bible. Now we need to stand for truth. We have a particular calling in this earth. They said, oh, close down. Oh, shut down. Oh, don't gather together. The Bible says, don't forsake gathering together. God has built up a community of faith. And live streaming just doesn't cut it. It's not the same. Because it's not just a sermon that touches the heart. It's humans that touch the heart. It's not just the preacher. It's not just the minister. Yeshua went forth. He sends forth people. He sends forth the disciples. It's each of us individually encouraging one another, ministering to one another, talking with one another, loving one another. There's a whole big difference of having someone pray for you who knows you and sending some prayer request to some prayer hotline somewhere. If that was the case, if that was what would work, if that's the best thing, then let's just sell all the properties and print the Bible in many languages and hire a bunch of helicopters to just drop it all over the world and the gospel would be done. But that's not God's plan. There's nowhere in the Bible that it says to do that. No, establish congregations and go forth city to city and take the gospel personally around the world and gather together to encourage one another, to build one, each one up, to minister and minister to the lost, to draw the lost in and to share the gospel with them. Because it's not hearing only, but it's seeing the word of the Lord lived out. And not just seeing it in one individual, but seeing it in a corporate body of believers as well. Where two or more are gathered together, there I am in my midst, he said. Not just one person in a prayer closet. He could have said, anywhere you are, I am there with you, and he does. But he also said, two or more gathered together. Calls for a gathering together. The world wants to shut that down. They don't want that to happen. The devil does not want that to happen. The devil knows that that is where the power of God is. In the preaching, in the hearing, in the living God's word. And he's doing everything he can to break it up and to cause 
congregations to go bankrupt and not be anymore. To be like the world, be silent, and then not to exist anymore. Except maybe online somewhere. Instead of being lighthouses on every corner. We become irrelevant. We've gone along with it. We think we're irrelevant. We don't think we have our act to play and a part to play. That we can just go unnoticed for four months or months at a time. No, God has called us for a purpose, corporately and individually, to shine his lights for him, to be seen, to be known, and to stand for the right to the very end, and especially here at the very end. And I think we're at the very end. I think we're getting very close every day. Lawlessness. So it says in Matthew 24, lawlessness will increase and they will persecute Bible believers and that's exactly what they're doing. Anyone who stands up and stands for truth or stands for righteousness, they try and cancel, they try and shut down, they try and silence, persecuting. Anyone who stands for faith, stands for bi the Bible, stands on the truth of the Bible, will be ridiculed, turned over, but nonetheless... We will endure to the end. There'll be martyrs along the way. They'll kill us. But some will endure to the end. God will have a remnant that endures to the end. But that doesn't happen. Persecution doesn't happen. Being killed doesn't happen when we just go along with their lies and their worldliness. It's when we stand for truth when wickedness is expelled out of our lives, that conviction comes into their heart and curse comes into their heart. And if they refuse to give up the curse, if they refuse to surrender to the Lord, then they will hate those who've ha who have gotten rid of the wickedness in their lives. And that's what the Bible is predicting will happen. God is calling for a faithful people who will stand for the right. Are we willing to be that? Are we willing to be a part of that? Are we willing to say, Lord, here I am, Change me. Here I am, Lord. Take it out of me. Take the thievery out of me. Take the lying out of me. Lord, use me. Whatever may come, whatever may be. Whether they behead me, whether they stone me, whatever the case. Paul went into a city. He started to expose their wickedness, and they stoned him. But by God's grace, they didn't kill him. And when he shook off the stones, what did he say? Oh, maybe that wasn't a good idea. Maybe I shouldn't have said that. Maybe let me reword that. Let me go and apologize to them for exposing their sin and let me be nice to them and let me see if I can win them over and let me see if I can be their buddies. No. He shook it off and he went back and he preached some more. And he went to the next city and he preached some more. And he continued to preach. Continued to call sin, sin. And truth, truth. It'll be trials, it'll be difficult, it'll be, it'll be martyrs. But we need to live for truth. Or there's no sense in living. Then what on earth are we doing? What's the purpose of the Bible? What's the purpose of God? What's the purpose of, of Yeshua coming to this earth? If not to call sin, sin, and to live a righteous life. That's what he came here to do. To demonstrate that it is possible by faith in the Heavenly Father to live in the flesh and yet not allow the flesh to live in us. To not let sin have dominance over us. To demonstrate that a person after generations of sin is able to be born into this world, come forth through the womb, and yet overcome the natural nature, the natural tendencies, the inner nature to lie, to steal, to take to be greedy, to be selfish, to be proud. And he demonstrated it in the flesh. In all ways tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Regardless of what the liars on TV say. He demonstrated it and he wants to do it again, this time in your flesh and in my flesh. To come in and root out all unrighteousness, and to fill us with his spirit, to fill us with his righteousness, and to shine as lights in the firmament, in this dark, dark world. Are you willing to do that?
Be willing to shine for him. Be willing to allow him to fill you and to use you. No matter what comes. No matter what endurance it takes. Let us pray together. And so if there's any area in your life, because before we pray, if there's any area in your life where God's brought to your mind any area where you're lying, lying to others, you've lied to others, you've made promises you haven't fulfilled, we've lied. You've lied falsely. Where you've professed to be a believer and you're not living that way. Or if you're a thief, any area where you've stolen, stolen time, stolen attention, stolen stuff, where you're deceiving yourself, deceiving God, taking from others, the moment when we pray, surrender that to the Lord. Accept his forgiveness, accept his mercy. Receive that message from that flying banner, that flying scroll. Let it sink into the heart and mind and let Yeshua take it away and remove it out of your life and forgive you. If there's wickedness in you, bitterness, wrath, revenge, any kind of wickedness, any sin, one thing lacking, any area that God's convicting you on, any area you're feeling cursed about, any area that you're feeling condemned regarding, in a moment when we pray, surrender it to the Lord. Receive his forgiveness. Accept Yeshua's sacrifice in your behalf and let him cleanse you from all unrighteousness and remove it from you. If you've been fearful of standing for the right and you've been compromising and playing around with the world, one foot in the world and one foot with God, trying not to stand out, trying to blend in, trying to be accepted by the world for fear of retribution. In a moment when we pray, you can surrender that fear and let God make you bold for him. Doesn't mean we shouldn't be nice, we shouldn't be unfriendly, doesn't mean we should be obnoxious. Of all people, we should be godly, loving, friendly, the friendliest, the happiest, the nicest, the most cooperative, as long as we're not compromising on truth and God's righteousness. And so if that applies to you, in a moment when we pray, let God do his work in cleansing you. Fourth, if you're willing to receive the Holy Spirit, willing to be God's banner, willing to be God's spokesperson, willing to be used by God, and letting his light shine in this world, as a little light, as a little light joined together with other lights shining brightly for him. Like the Havdalah candle, like the menorah, one little light shining together with other lights, burning brightly for him. United together. And if that's your prayer, let's invite the Holy Spirit to come into us, and empower us, transform us, change us, and use us. If any of those areas apply to you, or maybe some other area that God's been speaking to your heart and mind about, let us pray together and let God use us and fulfill his purpose in creating us and making us individually and as a congregation. Our Lord and our God, ruler of the universe, we praise your name. Thank you for your great love in warning us Thank you for your righteousness. Thank you for shining brightly. Thank you that you did not compromise on this earth and have not compromised in heaven or ever. Thank you that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. Thank you that you remain faithful. You remain righteous. You remain true. You remain just. Your word is truth. You don't change. Thank you for that stability. Thank you for giving us a warning Thank you for sending forth your message. Thank you for sending forth your conviction. Thank you for sending forth your spirit. Thank you, Yeshua, for coming to this earth. Thank you, Father, for sending him and giving him to us. Thank you, Yeshua, for giving yourself to us. Thank you for gaining victory over the devil and over sin and over self. 
And thank you for dying for our sins and removing the wickedness out of us, burying it into the depths of the sea, covering it with a lead weight. Thank you for forgiving us and forgiving us and cleansing us from all unrighteousness, saving us from our sins. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for coming into this world. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for coming into our hearts and minds. Thank you for illuminating us. Now empower us and transform us, change us and shine out of us and use us in winning souls for your kingdom and taking this gospel to the whole world. In Yeshua's holy name, amen.